Welcome once again to this online worship service at Christ Alone Lutheran Church in Mequon and Thienesville, Wisconsin. On this third weekend in Advent, our hearts are lifted in joyous anticipation for the coming of our King. Let's begin by singing a hymn celebrating the work of John the Baptist, There's a Voice in the Wilderness Crying. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
we join in the prayer of the day. Hear our prayers, Lord Jesus Christ, and come with the good news of your mighty deliverance. Drive the darkness from our hearts and fill us with your light. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading will also serve as the focus for today's sermon from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the Sovereign Lord will make righteousness, and praise spring up before all nations. The Word of the Lord. We continue with our second reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. The word of the Lord. We acclaim today's gospel. Alleluia. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Alleluia. Today's Gospel recorded by St. John in his Gospel, chapter 1. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, Then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Finally, they said, Who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, 
but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. Let's continue with the hymn of the day, O Lord, how shall I meet you? Dear friends in our Lord Jesus Christ, I confess I'm sad. I'm sad when I think of dear friends who have suddenly lost their little child. I'm saddened by the divorce of friends who had been married for 15 years. I'm saddened to think of former church members I've taught who have now left the Christian faith. I'm saddened by families I love who have been torn apart by strife. I'm saddened to think of the tears of a woman whose husband was killed in a car accident or of a husband who lost his wife to cancer. I'm saddened by hundreds of personal disappointments in ways that people I love have been broken. And then I'm also sad on a bigger impersonal scale too. I'm sad when I hear that the truckload of immigrants suffocated in the blistering heat of Texas or of tens of thousands of young women who have been sold into the sex trade because of the greed of traffickers. I'm sad when I think of what it must be like to live in Gaza right now, ruined and terrified as it is by the arrogance and selfishness of leaders in Hamas. I'm sad when I think how many people are living in poverty and ruin and starvation and sickness because of the huge inequities of this world often inflicted by others. I just want to turn off the TV or the computer screen and retreat into a little bubble of my own where I can shield myself from the brutal realities of what sin and Satan have done to this sad planet. As if that weren't enough, I'm also saddened by my own many failures to be the person I want to be. I disappoint myself in so many ways that I would find it hard to share with another human being. 
I wear sadness like invisible, painful clothes covering my body, clothes that have become as familiar to me as any that I see hanging in my closet. And then I come to church on this third Sunday in Advent, and someone lights a pink candle on the wreath of anticipation and explains to me that the pink candle can symbolize the joy that Christ has come to bring into the world. And I wonder, deep down, can it be joy? Can my soul begin to know gladness amid all the pain and destruction and sadness that marks life for people all over the world? Do you ever wonder the same thing? I'm glad the Lord has given us reason for that pink candle today, that this Advent season makes an allowance for sad hearts to hear a message of joy, for tears to be dried, and for hope to spring eternal. That message allows us to do spiritually what some of you may be doing physically at Christmas when you go out and buy a new shirt and trousers or maybe a new dress for the occasion. That's what Isaiah tells us today. God gives us new clothes for Christmas and invites us to wear them. The prophet Isaiah is probably the best known and most dearly loved of the Old Testament prophets in the Bible for the ways that he would help Israel keep hope in the face of a very dark time in her history. Those times were dark by her own doing. It was a generation of God's chosen people that could be wrapped up in really two words, rich and ungodly. Military success had brought optimism, economic prosperity, and luxury. But the flip side of this is that God's people in Judah were not at all interested in spiritual matters. And it showed. Injustice ruled the land. The poor were being pressed down by the rich. Worship was an empty shell of rituals. Rulers relied on foreign alliances with Egypt and Assyria for their security, but not on the Lord their God. God did not even have their attention. It was a spiritually deadly time for these people who once were on fire for their God. They would soon be uprooted from their homeland and dragged into Babylon to consider their ways and return in their hearts to their God. So much did their God love them. Yet amid this prospect of sadness and punishment, God uses his prophet to promise that he would send a savior. His servant, he calls him, his own son. In fact, in the last part of this prophecy, that servant reveals himself in five beautiful, comforting, cheerful songs that would be called servant songs. Can I remind you what this Savior would say to his fearful, chad, uh, saddened people? Uh, in chapter 42, the first of those servant songs, the Lord's servant is compassionate toward the bruised reed of Judah. Chapter 49, the Lord's servant will be a light for all the nations of the world. Chapter 50, the Lord God will help his servant and hold him out before mankind. Chapter 53, the Lord's servant will suffer for straying sheep and will be glorified. And chapter 61, which we're looking at today, the Lord anoints the Lord's servant to proclaim good news to the broken. Well, let's take a look, a closer look at this fifth servant song today. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, it begins, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. What beautiful pictures of relief for those who knew they were facing captivity, hardship, and sadness. This Messiah servant, this anointed one of God, would bandage broken hearts and free captives and punish their enemies. He would dry tears and comfort the grieving. This promise includes returning the captive people to their homeland eventually. But the comfort goes way beyond that event 
which would take place after 70 years in captivity. It's talking about God's mighty act of redeeming them and all the world from their destructive guilt of dying for his people in their place and for their misdeeds, and then pronouncing them forgiven for their sins by the penalty he paid. And now he compares the results of his saving work to giving his people new clothes to bestow on them, we're told, a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Instead of the ugly, sad clothes of alienation from God they were used to wearing, like ashes rubbed on their heads in mourning and despair, the Messiah's work would clothe them with beautiful new clothes. In fact, God would look good because of the clothing he was giving them. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the Messiah says, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Like a beautiful oak tree, green, growing, and strong, God's people, forgiven, confident, joyful, would show the world just how great his salvation really is. Best of all, these clothes would come absolutely free for the having, paid for by the Lord himself. Now, who would deliver all these blessings? Jesus once stood in front of his home crowd in the synagogue of the town of Nazareth where he grew up. And they handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he turned to these very words and read them. Then he looked everyone in the eye and said, Today, these words are fulfilled in your hearing. I'm the one bringing these beautiful clothes to you, he was saying. I will purchase you these garments of salvation. I am the one, the Messiah of God, your Savior, your King, your Lord. Trust in me. Some did, but many didn't, and they were ready to throw him off a cliff. To this day, Jesus calls all of us to look to him for that salvation and to truly enjoy the clothes he came to win for us. Ours is the attitude of faith that Isaiah reflected. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Do you hear how the Lord would have you receive his free clothing of salvation? This might sound like an easy response. Who wouldn't want to wear new, beautiful clothes? But think of this from a different point of view. Imagine, for example, that the Cinderella story went just the way it was supposed to go. Cinderella gets to go to the prince's ball. She's beautifully turned out by her fairy godmother with a gorgeous dress and crystal slippers. The prince falls in love and chases her down. They get married and live happily ever after, except that she doesn't feel comfortable as a princess in her nice new clothes. And she decides to put on her old rag of a dress, return to her unkind stepmother, and clean cinders out of the fireplace for the rest of her life. What would you say to her? Cinderella, what are you thinking? How could you give up the love and the splendor that's been given to you? And she says, well, it's, not, it's just not me. I'm more comfortable with my former life. No one expects much of me there. I don't really like my new clothes. Isn't that what we're saying? When we exchange the lovely robe of Christ's righteousness for, example, the pleasures of this world and a carefree life that says, I don't want anyone to expect anything of me. I don't want to be a prince or a princess. Uh, I don't want people to expect a godly life or an active role of serving my God and my neighbor. Something is desperately wrong in that case. It's a slap in the face to that prince who will give her everything for her happiness. Maybe she needs to re-examine her new identity, embrace it, and not crave for the old ways which really were not happy ones at all. There were people who wanted to return to slavery in Egypt 
rather than face the adventure of getting established in the promised land. And there were also people who chose to stay in exile in Babylon permanently than face the new life of rebuilding Jerusalem and awaiting their Savior. And you could say there are plenty today who are more comfortable with their old clothes of worldliness and promiscuity and addictions and greed and family animosity rather than wearing the new clothes of righteousness and peace and joy freely given them by the Savior. Clothes that display God's gracious splendor. Clothes that proclaim to the broken, my God rescued me from myself and he will rescue you too. Get to know him. Wear his clothes. Will you wear your new clothes? Will we let him give us his joy? It is sheer pride which causes human beings to say, I don't want the clothes he has for me. That says, I don't necessarily want the happiness he purchased. See the beautiful garment of salvation which Jesus has bought you at great expense. Put off the rags of sadness. Let him put on you the crown of beauty and the oil of joy and a garment of praise. O Zion's daughter, rise to meet your lowly king, nor let a faithless heart despise the peace he comes to bring. All glory to the Son who comes to set us free with Father, Spirit, ever one through all eternity. Amen. Let's confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We now join in the prayer of the church for this day. Come, dear Savior, we long for your appearing. Come to cheer us with your promises. As you once cheered your ancient people throughout their long night of waiting and watching, come to restore our hope. Rouse us from the slumber of despair. Lift our hearts from petty earthbound goals and direct our eyes above from where you will soon come to make all things right again. Come and work in us a godly grief and a genuine sorrow over sin. Forgive us for the shameful way we have dishonored you and the shabby way we have dealt with one another. Through your mighty word, 
stir up in us a ceaseless yearning to give ourselves to others as you have given yourself for us. Come also to rekindle our joy as we prepare to celebrate your first coming. Do not permit a frenzied busyness to rob us of your peace or to deprive us of times to ponder and to wonder at your word. Set our hearts apart from the bustle and the clamor and the jostle of these days. Fill us with the quiet delight of finding you in the manger and keep hearts and minds undisturbed by the great throng that streams by uncaring. We pray also for those enduring great sorrow, for those undergoing spiritual trial, and for those whose restless hearts have no knowledge of your coming. Comfort, strengthen, and illumine them with the sweet peace born of your love, and keep them in the way of peace by your holy word. Come quickly, dear Lord, and fill our longing eyes with the light of your coming. We wait, we keep watch, and in you we put our hope as we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and grant you peace. Amen. We close with the hymn, Let the earth now praise the Lord. It's a joy for our congregation to host these online worship services, and we're very pleased that you tune into them. We're also very grateful for the support that you give us, both in sharing these broadcasts with others, as well as financial support, which allows us to keep doing it. We pray that God richly bless you as you look forward to celebrating the birth of God's Son.